The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. So the next coming up will be Ned Lyon from Simpson Gump Gumperts and Hager, or SGH, uh, large consulting firm, uh, has presence on the East Coast, West Coast, and Ned is going to be talking about hmm, a little bit more about moisture and concrete and then some of the testing that goes along with it. Uh, Simpson Gumperts and Hager is a consulting engineering firm. We design, investigate, and rehabilitate uh, buildings and structures. I work in the building technologies uh, uh, section of the company, and more specifically, I'm what's known as a building scientist, somebody who knows a lot about heat and moisture flow. Uh, concrete is not my primary focus. Uh, concrete is simply one of many materials that I deal with in looking at moisture flow uh, through buildings. So I'm going to feed you a little bit of science here because that's what I thought I was supposed to do. And hopefully you'll understand a little bit more about how moisture is stored in concrete, how moisture moves in concrete, and how we actually try to measure what's there and perhaps determine uh, whether or not it's a good amount or not. Now, basically, concrete is a hydroscopic material. That means that even though you put a lot of moisture in it to make it, and it hydrated, and it dried out, it's going to want to equilibrate itself with the uh, ambient moisture content, specifically the relative humidity. And that way, it's much like a piece of wood, except wood wets and dries a lot faster than concrete. Now, initially you have excess water. Um, unfortunately for somebody like me who tries to calculate drying, uh, the properties of concrete change a lot. That soup that you pour down first through green concrete, I don't know how I'd measure the properties of some of that. We usually measure properties of the concrete after it's cured, but even after it's cured, uh, it can change again with carbonation. Uh, and it will vary depending on how you mix it. Now, you, you can mix according to a standard, but, you know, the sand in one part of the country may be a little different than the sand somewhere else, and the aggregate's different. All of these things affect how the concrete works. Now, Woofy Software uh, was developed by the Germans, uh, some friends of mine at IBP, uh, it is a well-proven program that calculates heat and moisture flow through various materials, one of which can be concrete if we can define that concrete uh, effectively. Now, there's no variable input, so I can't do green concrete. There's no gravity flow of moisture or pressure flow or salt migration involved in the WUFI calculation. So it doesn't do that but it helps give us a better understanding of what's going on. Concrete is hydroscopic. That means as the relative humidity changes, it tries to equilibrate with um, the moisture in the air. And this is a typical uh, what's called absorption isotherm. And actually, uh, I've indicated it as this dotted line here as a, a relative moisture content percent, and this is actually in pounds of water per cubic foot, but that will change with different weights of concrete. Actually, what we do is we put the concrete in various humidities and weigh it, but this is an average line. If you start dry and you move your way up, you follow below this curve and meet it at the top, 
and if you do this in reverse order, you actually stay above this curve until you meet it again at the bottom. So it doesn't matter if my concrete's totally dry, I get it down to, to zero extra moisture, uh, you know, it's probably about 60% RH in this room, it's going to want to equilibrate with the 60% RH. Now just to look at some of the differences in the concrete, uh, these are three different concretes from the Woofy database. There's only about seven in the database at the moment. And, you know, I'm not sure I could trust any of them as far as I could throw them because they're done by universities with graduate students who, yeah, they do the test, but is the result really the result? So we see here that the blue line is a, a, a 0.5 water cement ratio concrete. Uh, the red line is a C3545, but this is a European mix because this was done by Fraunhofer, so it could be a little different than what we do here. And then there's this little oddity, a C1215, that is a black line. And you can see that, well, the first two look like they're fairly similar, and the third one is an outlier. So we can have different amounts of moisture that are stored in our concrete based on how it's mixed. Now, the air we breathe has moisture in it, and we know that at high temperatures, if we have no other moisture sources, the relative humidity goes down. At low temperatures, the relative humidity goes up. So this means on your construction site, if it's hot and humid in the afternoon and it's cooler overnight, it's even more humid overnight. So your drying, which is uh, based on vapor pressures, which are based on relative humidity of the air, are going to vary through the day. So the likelihood is that if you wanted a drying environment, you'd want low relative humidity in the space around your concrete, and you're probably not going to get it. Now, it's a different world inside the concrete. Because inside the concrete, we have a lot of little pore structures, little spheres. And water, as you know, is very attractive. Liquid water really wants to stick to things. That's how we get capillary flow. So if you can imagine, these are two pores. They would be connected by a bunch of capillaries where water, liquid water would be transferring and some vapor would be transferring. But inside these spaces, if we have high temperature, we have more energy in the system and we get more vapor being pulled up. If we have low temperature, we have low energy, so we have less vapor in those little pore spaces. But in fact, we have exactly equal relative humidities in both situations. And if you think that's a little hard to grasp, I happen to catch it by mistake. In one of the studies I did with Peter for ASTM, we called the GRACE study, we had concrete curing in a room under 70 degree, 50 percent relative humidity conditions. And I was data logging some vicellular loggers or probes in the concrete. And one day, the HVA C system went out of control. And you can see the red line. We're cruising along at about 72 degrees, and all of a sudden it dropped into the 50s. The green line is my relative humidity. Now that had been steadily going down over the nine or 10 months that I was recording data, but right at this point, it blipped up. And then it came right back down to 70 degrees. This says, you know, okay, if I can measure relative humidity in concrete, and I know the isotherm, I know how much moisture there is in concrete. So that's how probably our best way of determining moisture in concrete in the field. Now, moisture has to move in concrete. One of the ways that it moves is by liquid transport. And the red lines here are the liquid transport functions for uh, this 
uh, water cement ratio concrete. The solid red line is what's known as uh, liquid uptake. If we take a cylinder of concrete and we dip it in water, it's going to the capillary action is just going to pull that water up into the concrete. So, yeah, feet squared per second. I really don't know what that is, so let's just stick with, you know, what's the relative difference? The larger that number, the more the uptake, the more the movement. The lower line, the dashed red line, is what's known as redistribution. If I take that sample out of the pan of water now, how does the water that's in that sample redistribute itself? How does it get to surfaces? And you can see that the liquid flows at a much slower rate. But I, I urge you to look at the 70 to 80 percent there. There seems to be a little uptick in that line. We'll see some more of that uptick. Now I took those three concretes I had and uh, I plotted them to the scale of the biggest one and we've lost our original 0.5 water cement ratio concrete here. Uh, and like I say, the dark lines are the saturated pickup. That's not what we're dealing with most of the time. Most of the time we're dealing with the redistribution flow. So if I blow this up, I see that I have, there's my, my blue line, my 0.5 uh, water cement ratio, but my other Concrete is coming in a little above my 0.5 water cement ratio, and, and my C1215 is like somewhere else. So there can be a wide variation in the way moisture redistributes itself through concretes depending on its mix. But again, look at that range between 70 and 80 percent. There is an uptick. Think of that as Big Sur, all right? It's a big wave of extra flow that we're getting that can now pick up whatever salt was left behind by any drier concrete and push it in the direction that the vapor is moving or the liquid water is moving. The water vapor permeance of concrete for the Germans and most of the Europeans is measured by dry cup. Think of yourself uh, uh, driving a Ferrari with a glass of water in your hand on a superhighway, right? You have a big open space, nothing in the way. That's a dry cup run, okay? We normally, a lot of tests we do in this country, we use a wet cup. And when you use the wet cup, it's 100% relative humidity on one side. So what am I doing? I'm loading up my concrete on that side with moisture. So now I'm driving my Ferrari with a glass of water, but I've got to dodge all these tanker trucks on the road because they're moving slow, but they're carrying more water, liquid water, through the system. So I, in fact, have a change in vapor resistance as I get wetter and wetter. In fact, when I'm totally saturated, I probably don't have any vapor flow at all. There's just not enough pathways for vapor to get through. Now, if I have the right properties for concrete, this storage function, this flow function, and this vapor permeability function, I can look at calculating concrete drying. So this is that 0.5 water cement ratio concrete and here I am 30 days in. Now the green line is relative humidity in the concrete, the blue line is the moisture content in the concrete and 30 days might be the time when you say okay concrete's cured I can uh, try and put down my floor now. But if we look at this line and like I say this line isn't indicative of concretes that you might use all the time. Woofy, the woofy concretes tend to be slower drying than we see in the field a little bit. But what happens now is if I put an impermeable layer uh, on my inboard side, 
in here, and I stop the flow out, flow out up here, then what's going to happen is these lines are going to rebound. This moisture is going to equalize through, and I would find that with this 5-inch concrete after 30 days, if I covered it up, I'm going to have almost as much moisture in it as when I started. Okay. If I go out six months, I start getting a little better. Six months, yeah, it's going to sit there six months and dry. Uh, and it gets worse if during that six months it gets rained on because the drying times for concrete are about twice as long if aged concrete is re-wet re as opposed to fresh concrete simply drying. And if I take this way out to three years, I'm finally getting somewhere. So if you want to rearrange your construction schedule and keep the building dry for three years, then you can probably go ahead and safely put down a floor, assuming that you have a good vapor barrier on the underside. These models are all assuming that I have metal deck or something like that impermeable on one side, so I have one side of drying. If I don't have a good barrier, what happens is over here on uh, yeah, here we go on this side, uh, I'm not going to get down to 80 percent because my soil is going to be near 100 percent. So this curve is going to start up here and come down. I'm going to have a continuous flow through. This moisture profile is going to have to profile from that higher uh, end. And if I cover the system up, I'll go right back up to what I had almost at the time the concrete was just green and hard enough to walk on. Now, Woofy has 2D, so here I have a little approximation of what happens when you pour concrete onto a metal deck. And if we start at 95% um, relative humidity, which is Probably not a bad guess. That's what we measure in really wet concrete and down the bottom of, of concrete. Uh, if I look at what happens over time, it dries at the surface, but notice that where it's thicker, it dries slower, and where it's thinner, it dries faster. So if I have an even five or six inch slab, a slab on grade, and I step down to do a grade beam at the edge, and I suddenly have 18 to 2 feet, uh, I'm not going to dry out. You know, that three years is nothing because I got all this moisture stored way down, and it's got to work its way back up. And if I don't get it out or uh, account for it, what's going to happen is that moisture will simply redistribute through the concrete and give me enough wetting at the surface. Again, that wave that comes through at, in, in liquid flow that picks up any residual salts that got left behind from the initial surface dry and just washes them right towards my sensitive finishes. If I look at uh, calculations over three years, this is the the, the amount, the whole thickness of that five inch slab has changed. And uh, in the predecessor to this program called Moist, I took this calculation and I was able by adjusting concrete parameters to reproduce Brewer's results for concrete drying from 1965. So the program is valid. I could recreate Brewer in Woofy if I adjusted the properties of the concrete. I couldn't get that first initial drying when everything's really wet, but you know, pick me up at about a month through when things have solidified, and I can follow that curve with a calculation. So, if I want to know how much moisture there is in concrete, what can I do? Well, if I'm in a laboratory, I take a sample, I weigh it, I heat it in an oven until it stops losing weight, and I know how much moisture was in the sample. My friends at Fraunhofer use a nuclear scan, and they measure hydrogen molecules in their samples. But they actually have samples that they 
have pre-made and put in walls and they can take out and bring into the laboratory and they can calibrate their nuclear scanner with a known source of moisture and then they can actually feed their sample through this device and get a slice-by-slice -slice moisture content. That's one of the ways that they've validated this program. So if I'm out in the field um, and I want to oven dry a sway and oven dry a sample, how am I going to get it? You know, uh, Maybe I whack off a piece at the edge, but is an edge indicative of my center? It's not a practical way of doing it. Can I nuclear scan? Well, nuclear scanning is used for measuring moisture in roofing systems, right? But what you have to do is be able to go to a spot, core it, and take out the material and say, okay, this number on my nuclear scanner is this much moisture for this particular roof. Uh, I can't do that here, you know. If I was going to do that with gravimetric, what am I going to do? Core drill a sample? If I dry core it, I heat it up, I blow some moisture off. If I wet core it, I put all this moisture back in, I'm not there. Now, for a long time we used calcium chloride dome test. Now, I know why we have this test, because when we were using asphaltic cutback adhesives with lots of asbestos in it, and we are using vinyl asbestos tile, all that mattered was that the surface was dry enough so that when I spread out this goo, it sank down into the top of the concrete and locked in. And if you've ever torn up an old VAT floor on a grade level where there's moisture below, you'll find that there's actually liquid water in the trowel grooves underneath that tile. It's just that those materials were extremely tolerant of that wetness. So all you had to do was make sure that surface was dry enough. If you want to do a little test and you have a, a, humid, a, a device that can measure humidity that's reasonably accurate, take a plastic bag, stick one of these uh, calcium chloride domes in it and read the humidity. It will read about 10% if the calcium chloride is good. Bag sealed up. Put one drop of water in there, it'll pop up to 35%. And it will stay at 35% until that drop of water is completely evaporated. So if I put 35% relative humidity as a boundary condition in my model, I can make an approximation of what that test does. And it only affects, in my calculations, the top quarter to at most half an inch of the concrete. That's all the test is able to look at. And I can adjust that by changing the humidity in the room before the test. So I can have a wet slab, and if I just bring the room humidity way down for a couple of days and then run the test, it will pass. And how do I know this? Well, I'm sure not many of you have had a situation where you actually had a slab drying in a conditioned space, but we had a job for uh, the federal government uh, a, humidified storage area for some uh, artifacts from the government. And uh, the first floor, they had a failure. And we recommended the only thing they could do is put down a specially designed two-inch topping slab and dry it, and then that would dry in a reasonable time. They could put a coating on that with a barrier underneath it, they'd be all set. Well, time for the two-inch material to be dry, they're running 70 degrees and 50 percent relative humidity and they keep test after test because at the time it was calcium chloride dome the manufacturer of the coating wanted it to be below a certain amount it would it just wouldn't drop fortunately it was not the summer in the DC area I said just stop humidifying it turned off the humidity let it drop into the 30s for two weeks test was fine, they put down a coating. We had been looking at the relative humidity. We knew that the two inch of topping was good, but it failed the calcium chloride test because the room was kept at 50%. Okay. 
We have an RH box surface measurement, an ASTM standard for that. Um, there's really no correlation to that test to, at the surface as to how much moisture there might be below. You know, so it's sort of like a modified calcium chloride test. If you were to let it go long enough, I suppose if it sealed everything up, all that humidity from down below would equalize, but that would be several months, and this is a 72-hour test. So it doesn't tell you a lot about the whole nature of the wetness. We have various electronic meters. We, we can get a good sense of relative moisture on a single slab, but again, how deep are they penetrating? The ASTM standard says it's about an inch. So what's going on below that? They're sensitive to uh, metals and other things that are in the surface. So they're, like I say, they might be good at saying this is a relative moisture, but in terms of being accurate for the whole thickness, uh, it's not there. So the best thing we have is probably probing to a depth and reading relative humidity. And even then, uh, we have some issues. Um, if I stick the probe in, and uh, what I'm doing is I'm trying to measure at a certain depth in the concrete here. Here's my 30-day. My Here's the depth, which is approximately 40% of the thickness. And when I put my probe down, I'm trying to measure that my relative humidity here in this case would be uh, uh, about 90 or so, uh, not down very far. So this is how much moisture I have. If I know enough about the concrete, I can tell whether or not that number that I read is a good enough number that if I seal the system up, the rebounding moisture isn't going to kick me in the butt again. Okay? And of course, if I let things dry longer, I get to a point here which is really the sweet spot. I mean, I have never seen a floor failure on concrete that I could measure at 70 to 75 percent RH. Now, think back. Where was that break point in the redistribution? where suddenly it's not up, it was between 70 and 80 percent. You know, I may be onto something here. If we tested enough good concrete and we could validate that, we'd probably find that in that range there's this upkick in flow, in liquid flow, that gets us in trouble. And if I look at measuring uh, in uh, the 2D world, now it depends on where I am. Uh, the scale here from, from left to, to right, uh, I would probably be looking at uh, a difference of maybe 4% in this particular model. Uh, there's been some tests done on slabs, again, because of the variability of the actual physical properties of concrete. This can vary a little bit. But now I'm reading 2% accuracy with my probe. And now I got two to three percent variation. So what am I reading? And what I have with the RH probe are some other issues with how well it does its job. Uh, the depth of the hole is important. As the thickness of the whole slab increases, the relevance of any reading I get decreases. So I think at ASTM we've determined that it's good for five, six inches of slab concrete, but if you get something really thick, uh, the two feet where that grade beam comes in, you rattle up. You're not going to get a good reading for that. Um, there are sometimes advantages to profiling, measuring at different thicknesses. I had one job, slab, suspended slab, a 35-year-old school, uh, calcium chloride test, off the chart. Uh, we have a terrible situation we have to go mitigate. Well, I went in and I measured with my temperature RH probes and I did a couple of depths, three depths, and I found basically I had 75% RH concrete except near the surface. 
Well, you know, it was an old school, and they had to come in and spray fireproofing on the ceiling. So when they sprayed the fireproofing on, they got the floor wet. And that little bit of wetness on the floor, and the humid conditions, because they weren't conditioning it, got that surface wet enough to fail a calcium chloride test, when in fact, had they sealed it up, that moisture simply would have redistributed itself into the drier concrete down below. So they didn't need to mitigate that. The diameter of the hole can be a problem. If I drill a half inch hole and I got two and a half inch aggregate and I hit a piece of granite dead on, I'm not measuring anything about the relative humidity in concrete. I'm measuring something that's really dry. The cleanliness of the hole, a little bit of concrete powder dust will jack any relative hu humidity reading in a hole way above what it's actually supposed to be. There's something about that powdery mix that emits more moisture, so we have to clean our holes very well. Uh, we found out before in the, in the gray study that I talked about before that the volume around the sensor, the air volume around the sensor, for some reason that made a difference. So as long as you were measuring with all one sensor, uh, you were fine, but the sensors had various spaces at the bottom of them, so you got different readings. And, and Peter tells me that's changing a bit with the changes we had. Um, additives and contaminants. I do not know how the sensors respond to some of the things we put in concrete to make it more workable. I can tell you that I've had manufacturers of the sensors come back to me and say, what did you do to our sensor? because we stuck it someplace where it got contaminated with something, we don't know what it was. Even in the GRACE study, one of the probes I put in immediately went off the chart. Pulled the probe, took it back, validated that it was reading correctly, brought it back in, put it in the hall, it read fine. It apparently had gotten a whiff of some contaminant in there which messed up its reading. Okay, and then if it weren't enough, we have ambient conditions. How well does that job site stay at an even temperature? Temperature. I don't care about relative humidity now. Temperature. And uh, this is from a study I did with uh, Ryan. Uh, this is a slab that, again, we data logged. And again, the relative humidity of the green line at the top uh, over the course of the test, this was a, a sloping down line, concrete's drying out, but the shop wasn't conditioned, so the, the temperature went up during the day and down at night. And those temperature variations gave me another couple of percent RH change from day to day. So now I had 2% for my pro, I had another couple of percent from where I might be measuring if I had different things. Now I gotta throw in 2% for what temperature has it been over the last 48 hours, 24 hours? Um, I have a lot of variation. So, ultimately, why bother? Okay, really, why bother? The moisture is gonna be there. You're not gonna have ideal drying conditions you're likely to have conditions that get the concrete wetter again. Yeah, I gotta just learn to live with the moisture that's gonna be in concrete. And how do you do that? You have to understand how it will affect the adjacent materials, and you have to have a plan to take effective countermeasures. We now recommend to all our clients that they carry moisture mitigation systems with their base bids and the base specs. If they happen to not need it by the time they get to put down the floor, great, they save a buck. But at least everybody's on track that they're going to do it up front and they're going to use effective products when they do it. And I think Peter's going to get to tell you a little bit more about that.